For more on the discussions related to China's auto industry, we are joined in Mumbai by Ravi Bhatia, who is the president and director of the Jato Dynamics in Beijing, Xing Lei, former chief editor of China Auto Review and co-host of China EVs and more. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Thank you. I Thank know you. these are the busy days for you guys uh, because of the Beijing Auto Show and all the global discussions related to the auto industry. I want to start about uh, the important topic of China's EVs. Uh, Mr. Xing, uh, the market penetration, according to the earlier plan, is likely to be 40% by the end of this year, but it's very much likely that goal will be achieved much earlier, at least according to some of the top auto company managers. So tell me more about where is China in terms of EVs? The couple of days before I um, arrived, the you know one of the organizations published a data in the first half of April, the first two weeks, uh, the retail sales penetration of NEVs went above 50% for the first time ever. 50.3% already, right? 50.3%. So that gives you an idea of where the market is right now versus the kind of expectations that uh, the tipping point has long passed and we're entering into another period. I wouldn't say uh, the growth that we've seen uh, the last few years, but uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that people, mm -hmm. when they make a purchase, either trade-ins policies currently in place to drive trading, more than likely you are going to buy an NEV because of the selection uh, variety yeah. at the different price points uh, is just uh, nowhere else in the world. Um, you oh my God, tell me that. more about the co uh, competition. I'm sure we have a lot of stories yeah. to tell about that. Uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Batia, your understanding of where China is in terms of new energy vehicle or PHEVs as well. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, both uh, new energy vehicles and PHEVs are important component of how we go into the future, which is more greener and less, less polluting. Uh, and China is clearly the place to be uh, for uh, the dynamism that is happening in the market. So as uh, you know, we just heard that 50.4% is what was crossed very recently. Uh, this is a benchmark anywhere in the world. Uh, mm. We have never not seen this kind of uh, new energy vehicle adoption rate. So there is there are a couple of things happening, I think, in China. Uh, one, we see uh, the innovation rate has gone, uh, you know, super, super fast. So we are beginning to see products getting launched in succession, which are trying to do outdo each other. So the level of innovation in not only the uh, the powertrain side of the vehicle, but other convenience is also accelerating very much. Mm -hmm. So customers are, I think, spoiled for the choice. And uh, the whole world is looking at the innovations happening in China, including India. Uh, mm -hmm. While everybody has sustainability goals, everybody is talking about getting there very quickly, but China has shown a model which others really aspire to come close to. India really right. is at a very low level of penetration. We just about crossed 2.1%. So, so you can see the difference between 50.3% and 2.1%. Uh, earlier, we see uh, the... Uh... American uh, EV uh, maker Tesla uh, cut its uh, rates on some of the models uh, sold in China. Later, we see uh, Li Auto immediately follow up. And we also saw uh, not only the traditionally successful, such as BYD in China, but also some of the others, uh, such as uh, Huawei and uh, also Xiaomi, uh, catching up into the auto industry, especially EVs. So what is the reality of competition here in the China market? Mr. Xing. Well, the reality, one word that I often use to describe the kind of competition is bloodbath. Um, the price deterioration of what you would expect a model to be priced at. Um, at a certain feature uh, and, and price point. So that has been coming down dramatically ever since Tesla cut prices 
in January of 2023. So mm. this price war has been going on for almost one and a half years. And Mr. Bhatia mentioned something about innovation. I could give you a, actual, uh, actually a metric of how fast innovation in China, and that metric is the expectation of a generational change, a model generation change is three years, a refresh is one year, and OTA update monthly. Basically, over the air updates, you know, like what you have on your phone. Yeah. And that has been happening, uh, at least for, for, you know, Tesla is, is really the one who started it, but all the China EV makers, right? OTA, their weekly updates, if not mm. daily, but it's, you know, at least monthly. What That's about the those. competition that you see, uh, Mr. Batia? Yeah, so so I see that uh, the value pricing equation has gone totally in favor of the customer. Uh, there are too many players jostling for position. Clear leaders are yet to emerge in China. Uh, you know, normally the automotive industry always talks about the top 10 or top 12 players. But here, there are many more players jostling for position. So they are kind of outdoing each other, not only in terms of pricing, but also the value that they are offering. So, so the customers in China are really in for a good time. They are being spoiled for choice and uh, at an amazing price. And it's a sales competition, isn't it, Mr. Xing? You see, uh, you know, the heads of the China automakers, they all have to become, to a certain extent, uh, internet influencers. <laughs> starting their own Chinese version TikTok, uh, you know, uh, studio in a way in order to attract all the eyeballs. And the sales competition is fearful here. I mean, the competition, we can talk about different uh, uh, kind of competition. And you mentioned yeah. these CEOs going up onto, you know, live stream and talking <laughs> about their products themselves, right? Yeah. Lei Jin, the, the example. And, and the latest number I've just heard Xiaomi plans to deliver 100,000 units this year, three mm. years after they decided to enter the auto industry and yeah. only a month after they launched this first model. It's right to, to the foreign, uh, the other competitors established, it's, it's unfathomable. You know, the traditionally very strong ones, uh, such as BYD and the very much technology related, uh, such as Huawei, and some of the earlier uh, 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 budding automakers, especially on EVs uh, uh, in China, how do you see um, they are trying to get their share of the uniqueness in the market? Mr. Xing, very briefly. Uh, it's price, affordability, feature, um, uh, iteration speed, uh, mm -hmm. faster market, manufacturing, everything is moving at, at fast. Fast, mm. you know? All at the same time. All at the same time. Mm. Mr. Batia, we understand the other way around because if you look at the German automakers, uh, since your organization is one uh, headquartered in Europe, um, they are saying, you know, we are not necessarily say we want to use trade against uh, uh, trade rules against uh, innovation, but rather we want to cooperate with Chinese automakers for the EV market and also for the EV technologies, not only in China, but also in the European market. So how do you see this competition, cooperation kind of thing having spillover effect worldwide? Yeah, I think what you're bringing up is very interesting. You know, uh, I, I believe uh, the industry has moved away from it, but country of origin is still very important. So when I talk about country of origin, we always talk about German cars, American cars, or Japanese yeah. cars. And now we talk in a very different way about Chinese cars as well. So, so while there is a pressure on international brands in China, which used to enjoy a very, very predominant position, but we are beginning to see Chinese manufacturers assert in the home market. But with the capacity that they have created, they have an ability to serve a very large proportion of new energy vehicles worldwide. We are already beginning to see this in many countries in Europe where there is distribution being set up. So JETO is working very closely with Chinese manufacturers, trying to help them map the market, trying to help them take a structure of the market so that they can understand what offerings will work in those markets. Because yeah. buyers tend to be different in every market. 
what works in one market may not automatically translate into a success in another market. So that's right. where our ability to you know map the market with factual information is being very helpful to a lot of Chinese companies. I see. Mr. Shing, earlier I talked to the global chairman of Mercedes-Benz. He was talking about investing more in China. The Chinese economy stabilizing and growing, mm -hmm. and also that it's open for foreign investment. Mercedes-Benz has been investing here for more than 20 years, and we continue to do so. We are uh, preparing for launches of our next generation electric vehicles uh, in China, and uh, with our joint venture partner here in Beijing, uh, we're putting significant investment into, into our operations. China is the biggest car market in the world and it's the biggest market for Mercedes. And uh, we are a company that, of course, we do business here. Most of our operations are here. So we build almost all the vehicles that we sell in China, uh, uh, in China. But we're also together with other partners and exporter back from China to Europe. Uh, so I think the message is we need to keep um, uh, trade relations open and vibrant focus on win-win in terms of economic growth uh, and uh, cooperate to, to further develop technologies, innovation, and also uh, keep our working on the CO2 reduction. So how do you see the diversity you know, of cooperation and competition, uh, once again, between Chinese automakers and international ones as well, both for China market and elsewhere? A blank line and another blank line. The first blank line on the bottom is a foreign automaker. The second bottom line, uh, the line on the bottom is a Chinese tech company. So going forward, you're going to see more of those foreign established automakers working specifically uh, in China, for China, with the Chinese tech companies. One is to fit into the local ecosystem. Two is to... Um, address the local customer needs. And three, just basically, uh, you know, being faster. You have to work with the local players. Uh, and I think mm -hmm. that's the formula for success for any foreign automaker. And you're going to see more announcements. So, Mr. Batia, now, there were earlier suggestions uh, uh, by uh, American administration officials, uh, uh, the uh, uh, frequent use of so-called overcapacity. Uh, this time also refer to the electronic vehicles, new energy vehicles in China. Now, how do you see really, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier, one is the China market, the other is Chinese and international automakers cooperate both for Chinese market and for the international market. Of course, the Chinese automakers are also going international as well. For example, establishing their manufacturing centers elsewhere and also exporting their products uh, overseas. So how do you see these very interesting combination and the, the so-called uh, uh, rhetorics of uh, uh, overcapacity these days you heard a lot in the uh, uh, media stories? I think there are three aspects of the story that we need to look at. One aspect Please. is the consumer's aspect, right? So to a consumer, a good value offering is always attractive. Okay. Consumer wants to get the best value for his money. And uh, if the product is satisfying the minimum needs of quality, he will be all right. The second aspect is the supply chain collaboration. So now we are beginning to see a position for China where there is a very important part of supply chain. So in supply chain, there are technology aggregates which move from one part of the world to the other part of the world. So you could, you are beginning to see more and more Chinese components inside the vehicles, which may not be labeled as Chinese vehicles. Now, the third mm -hmm. is the full vehicle exports. Now, it's the full vehicle exports which are uh, raising the flag everywhere. So, so then the issue of supply uh, overcapacity comes in, the issue of barriers come in. Because OEMs, uh, the countries are trying to protect the domestic OEMs. They are trying to protect their jobs. So these are emotive issues in all the countries. So when you talk about jobs, when you talk about you know capacity and protecting okay. local manufacturing, it's always mm -hmm. a always an emotive issue. But I think yeah. from supply chain issue, the share of Chinese components in global cars is already very high. So the overcapacity uh, issue, uh, the caveat is uh, what happens when the NEV take rate um, uh, goes to, you know, possibly 75 percent, 
some have forecasted by uh, 2030 in China. What happens with the ICE, which is the internal combustion engine vehicle, that'll be down to 25%. Now there's tens of millions of capacity on that end of the game. What happens? What happens to mm. the jobs? What, ha what happens to those capacity? I think that's, that's the thing to watch. Mm. So you are saying the overcapacity is not necessarily about the spillover of competition internationally for uh, EVs, but rather what happened to the traditional automakers, the overcapacity of theirs. The, the simple answer is yes. Uh, Mr. Batia, we also know that these uh, traditional automakers, they will be either kicked out of the market because they are not changing, or um, they're very much in line now already also switching to new technologies and also to uh, uh, NEVs and uh, PHEVs as well. Yeah, there is a lot of pressure on traditional automakers to respond uh, to the new energy vehicle race, which is happening right now. Uh, the question is, in every country, the situation on ecosystem readiness is not similar. While China has a very strong ecosystem, which facilitates the use of new energy vehicles, other countries are still catching up. So if I was to do a readiness index of all the countries, they don't rank similarly. So there are two things which have to happen. The NEV products have to arrive, the ecosystem has to be ready, and the customer have to transition. All these three things falling in place will make the world a more greener, more better place. For new energy vehicles and also HPEVs, what it could mean, how much an opportunity do we know that is there to exist for innovation and therefore for scaling up of the latest manufacturing as well? One is simplifying the manufacturing process. And you're seeing this happening, you know, from Tesla, from the Chinese EV companies. Battery innovation, whether it's chemical or structural innovation, is happening fast. Uh, autonomous driving. So in China, it's NOA, which is the navigate on autopilot. If you don't have that feature, what the customer expected, uh, you're not going to sell. So that's one mm. huge racetrack. And fourth, how you interact with the vehicle through voice recognition, through different UI and UX, uh, right. outside and inside the vehicle. Uh, is all of these things are very important as it's happening at a fast pace. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Batia, Mr. Xing. All the best and have fun at Beijing Auto Exhibition.